morning, everyone. We're doing a series in the book of Acts. We've been uh, doing it for a couple of weeks now. And um, it's a book that helps us to see God's plan by God's power through God's people. And last week, we looked at a miracle that happened in Acts chapter 3 at the temple gate. And it was a miracle of uh, a layman being made to walk by Peter. And this week, we want to look at the sermon that Peter gives as a response to this miracle. And to look at that sermon, we're going to read and think through Acts chapter, tw- Acts chapter 3, verses 11 So this sermon has a lot of different things that, that, uh, that Peter addresses and thinks about. But I want to start by looking at something that is really important. The first thing Peter does is he explains to his audience who Jesus is. And we see that in verses 11 to 15. And it says these words. When the beggar held on to Peter and John and all the people were astonished and came running to him in the place called Solomon's Colonnade, when Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he, dis- though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murder be released to you. You killed the author of life. And when we look at that passage, I want to start by noticing what Peter does throughout this whole episode whether in the miracle or even now. One of the things I love about Peter is Peter, right from the beginning, makes sure that Jesus gets all the credit. In verse 12, he says, Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Peter's saying, listen, don't look at me. 
It'd be later that he says, it is, Je- is, it is Jesus' name and faith that comes to him that has given this complete healing to, this, to him as you all can see. <clears throat> Peter is making sure that Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one who is making all of this happen. Peter wants no confusion. Jesus is the one behind the, the healing and he is different from all other men. It is from there that, G- that Peter begins to explain who <clears throat> Jesus is. <clears throat> Our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. Jesus is God's glorified servant. He's obedient to his father, even to death on a cross. Peter describes Jesus as the servant that we find in Isaiah 53. For those who were in Peter's audience, they would have known the way that Peter was describing Jesus as the one, the predicted suffering Messiah that would come and rescue humanity. Jesus is God's servant. But Jesus also is Savior. Jesus' name means Lord of salvation. And it's through Him and Him alone that we can be saved. And through him that you and I can have hope for redemption from sin. The word Christ, he is called the Christ, which means the Messiah. He is the rescuer. So Jesus, so, so Jesus is God's servant. And he is the Savior. He is also the holy and righteous one. And when Peter says that, he is telling his audience and he is telling us that Jesus is God. Every Jew would know that. And so Peter is proclaiming that Jesus is different from you and I. That he is holy. That he is righteous. That he is the only one without sin. And he is the only one capable of rescuing humanity. And finally he is called the author of life. Jesus is the giver of life again. Emphasizing his deity. He is the creator of life with the Father and the Spirit. And He is the only one capable of saving us in our sin. Peter then tells us what Jesus has done. Tony, would you read verses 15 through 18? So Peter begins to tell us now what Jesus has done. And the first thing he explains is that Jesus has risen from the dead. He has overcome sin and death. And everyone is a witness of it. Every sermon in Acts, it's interesting, every sermon in Acts focuses on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and is alive. The resurrection validates who he is and it validates what he said. It's because of what he has done, his life, death, and resurrection, that all of us are now faced with the reality of having to really wrestle with Jesus by accepting or rejecting what he has said. Because of what he has done, we can know that the power that Jesus had to be risen from the dead is given to us as we put our faith in him. But the second thing that Peter talks about is the fact that Jesus healed the beggar. See, one of the things I think is really important for you and I to understand is that Jesus' resurrection is not the end of his involvement in our lives. He has and does have an impact in our lives today. See, you and I can have a relationship with Him. We can be restored with Him. We can be changed by Him as we put our faith in Him. And as we trust and live for Him, He transforms our lives. He transforms us. And He changes us in the image 
of Christ. And so Jesus is not done with us just because we put our faith in him. There's a, big, there's a continuation of a relationship that is going to change and bless and transform and who we are. Tony, would you read verses 13 and 15? You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one, and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. So we see who we are. Actually, we start with, with the audience finding out who they are. They are the ones who handed him over to death, even though Pilate wanted to let him go. Notice the the, the contrast. You traded the righteous one for a murderer. And you killed the author of life. Don't ever call Peter soft when it comes to his sermons. He's going right for the jugular. He's telling them who they really are and what they have done and the gravity of it all. He tells them that they are guilty of sin and that sin will separate them from God. And you and I both have the same problem. See, we have a sin problem. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there are none who were righteous. Not one. Not one. And because of our sin, in Romans 3, 5, it tells us that we are deserving of God's wrath. And so Peter lays out for us who Jesus is, what he's done, and who we are, and what we're facing. And with that, if it ended there, we'd be in a deep he tells us how we need to respond or how we should respond to Jesus and we see that in verse 19 where it simply says repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out Peter calls us to repentance Like the resurrection in the book of Acts, repentance is in every sermon. Repentance means to turn around and to seek forgiveness from sin. To turn to Jesus, the Savior that the Old Testament predicted, to give salvation to those who would believe. It's removing the pride and the idols in our lives and allowing Jesus to reign as Lord in our lives. And when we repent, when we repent, God wipes our sins away. It's an amazing reality. He wipes our sin away. Awesome. You see, repentance, I I was reading this week a a lot about repentance because I wanted to to just think about it differently because we hear about repentance all the time. We know that repentance means to turn around, right? We know that it means to turn away from sin and to, 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 to walk towards Christ and, and we know all of that but sometimes we just don't think about repentance what I thought was really really valuable for me and I want to share with you uh, it's how imp- repentance should impact our lives in four unique ways and I believe this is true that if we are truly repenting these four things should happen in our lives repentance should impact our minds We need to grasp what we have done wrong and the gravity of it. Too often, we don't care or think or worry about our sin. It doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, I guess I've sinned. Recognize that our sin separates us from God. We don't understand that our sin impacts the lives of those around us and has consequences that impact lives. We need to understand what we have done and the gravity of it. I remember seeing this very clearly um, at, at a church that I was at when I was there as a young kid 
And this, this older gentleman, who I really respected, walked out to the front of the church. And he said, I need to confess with you some wrongs that I've committed to those who I love, to those that I work with, to those who I've put my trust in. And I understand the, the damage that I've done. I recognize that my sin causes the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme His name. Do you think about the gravity of your sin? Does it impact your mind to a point where you realize, I have really done something wrong? Or do you push it off? Do you take it lightly? I know a lot of people who live under this mentality. They, they kid around about it, but I know that they, they, they live this way. It's easier to get forgiveness than to ask for permission. Ever hear that phrase? It's easier to ask forgiveness than to ask, than, 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 it, it, easier to ask forgiveness than to ask for permission. And you know what? That's true. It's true. The problem is forgiveness costs a whole lot more. And it costs the king of glory his life. And it caused our Savior and King to have to endure the full, unadulterated wrath of God. Sometimes I just don't see the gravity of my sin. And God says that repentance requires getting that. It should impact your mind. But it should also impact your heart. You should be grieved about your sin and your desire to get rid of it. Does your sin bother you? Does it cause you to go, I have really hurt my Lord. I've hurt my King. I've hurt others. And real repentance gets in our minds, but it gets in our hearts as well. I had a student, I was a senior pastor at the time, but I had a student that, that would come to me, and this is, how, this, this is honestly what he said, you know what, I, it doesn't matter what I do or how I sin, because I've trusted Jesus, so I know I'm going to heaven. So it doesn't matter. That's a problem, isn't it? One, I'm not sure he understands the gravity of it, of his sin. But more importantly here, it doesn't grieve him. It doesn't, hasn't impacted his heart. Does your sin, does your sin make you sad? Does it hurt you to know that you have rebelled against the one you love? I remember when I was a kid. When I was a little kid, um, I remember... I was being babysat by my mom. Now, my mom was, honest to goodness, the closest thing I knew to a saint. You know, the, 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 the kind of like exalted kind of saints that we talk about. Not the saints that you and I are, which are broken and messed up. But the, the idealistic kind of saint, you know, that was her. I mean, she was the sweetest, nicest, kindest, most godly woman I ever met. And I was sitting around banging doing slap shots against the garage because I was trying to get my slap shot down and my garage was in boxes. I knew that I wanted to learn how to hit the corners, right? Boom, boom. And my mom comes out, Bobby, please don't hit the, hit the hockey puck against the garage because you could dent it. My, my mom was 75 years old. And I was like, okay, my mom. She went back in. I thought I could hit it softer, you know? So instead of slap shots, I was doing what we call snap shots. And she walks back out. 
And all she did was walk out and look at me. And my heart broke. Because I knew that someone I loved had asked me to do something for everyone's good. And I willingly just not only disobeyed her, but went out of my way to deceive her. My heart was grieved. Does your sin, one, do you understand the gravity of it? And two, does it move you to a place of grief? Three, it needs to impact our will. We must desire real change that yields our will to Jesus. It's one thing to say, I understand the depth of it, I really feel bad, but never to say I'm going to turn. The will is the idea of truly saying to change my actions. I'm going to change my heart by God's grace. I'm going to change who is sitting on the throne of my life. So it impacts our, our mind, it impacts our heart, it impacts our will, and it impacts our soul. We need to rest in Christ and in His redemption for transformation. Here's the deal. Your mind can be there, your heart can be there, and your will can be there, but if it's on your own power, you will never, ever change. You need to allow Christ to reign in your life in such a way that He is changing who you are. It's one of the things I love about Jim Hobensack. Jim's such a great guy, and, and, and we get to pray every Friday, and, and he'll, he'll be like, oh, Bob, I've got to work in this scenario. I've got to work on that. I've got to get this figured out, but I know I can't do it. I know I can't do it. I know that God has to do it in, in me. Because I just, I just need to trust Him. I need to allow Him to do it. And you and I need to do the same. We need to understand the gravity of our sin. We need to grieve our sin. We need to change our ways. But we need to rest in Christ as we do it. We need to allow Him to be the agent of change in our world. So God is calling us to repentance. He's calling us to repentance. Peter's calling us to repentance. Um, and we need to uh, respond to that. So, we need to um, we see what Jesus has done. We see, um, we see who he is. We see what he's done. We see that we're sinners. We see how we are to, to respond, respond in repentance. And so then, Peter tells us something I think is really valuable for us. He shares with us why you and I should respond with repentance. Why we should turn our ways. And so, Tony, would you read verses 19 to 26 for me? Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago to his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, Through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So the question is then asked, why repent? Why repent? Well, Peter tells us, first and foremost, your sins are wiped out. Righteousness. The psalmist tells us that when, when we confess our sins, that God removes our sin as far as the east is to the west. 
He wipes them away. You do not have to sit in regret. You do not have to live in fear. When you and I repent, when you and I turn, it is finished. It is done. Our sins are wiped away. What an amazing reality. The burden of sin is removed. Our shame is gone. And our standing before God is made whole. Second, it says in this passage, the times of refreshing await. Instead of the weight and burden of sin, you and I experience the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and all the rest of them. Because I can't remember them right now. But they are ours. Isn't that a great reality? Instead of, of, of a happiness that fades, that this world gives, that sin gives, you and I can experience joy and fulfillment in Christ that lasts. Times of refreshing. The idea is kind of like this. And I've done this a ton of times. I'll go and I'll play volleyball. And it'll be hot as Hades, just like it is outside there today. And you play, and you play for hours, and you're like sweating like a bear. And it's disgusting. And no one will come near you. And that's okay. And I'll drive home, and I, I'm just hot as Hades. I'm sweating like, all over the place. And I get to the house, and instead of going in the house, you know what I do? I walk to my backyard. I just walk to the backyard, and I stand at the edge of the pool, and I just go... Boom! And I just fall into the water. And I just love to do that. I fall in that water. And it's like, ah, times are refreshing. You know, it's like drinking that, that bottle of water on that boiling hot day that restores and re energizes. What God is saying, what Peter is saying here is, you know what? The sin that is in our lives, it's like drinking salt water. Salt when we would wrestle. And so there are these little jellies. You buy them in the store with, with sugar in them. Well, for wrestlers, what they did, they, they, they replaced the sugar with salt. They're called salt gels. And you eat them. And they're, instead of sugar, it's just salt. And you eat them. And, you know, they, you know, for some reason, I like them because I like salt, as my daughter will tell you. And I'll chow them down, but immediately, a couple minutes later, guess what? I'm dying of thirst. As good as it might be to chow down on that, I'm always thirsty. And that's what sin is like. It, it's like drinking salt water. You may think... It's getting you somewhere. But it just leaves you with a deep, deep thirst. A thirst for the one who does fulfill our hearts. Jesus. But when you and I come to him, when he is our king, when he is the one that is nourishing our soul, our bodies, our lives are refreshed. They're made new. They're made whole. Times are refreshing. Doesn't that sound good? I got to tell you, I mean, this is, this is a Lynn Jackson phrase. She always comes to, whenever I talk, she goes, Bob, I'm just praying that God gives you times of refreshing. And I'm like, that's great, Lynn. Thank you. You're so upbeat. I love that. And, and she does. She just wants me to have times of refreshing. And, and isn't that a great reality that was you and I trust in, and draining that you can be refreshed and restored in Him? Let me ask you. Because after a while talking to Lynn, I keep asking myself, am I missing this? Am I missing this? I, 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 I ask this simple question. Lord, am I missing times of refreshing? And I'll ask you that too. Are you missing times of refreshing? If you are, may I encourage you to search your heart and look for those drains of sin that are, that are keeping you from enjoying Jesus to the full. May I encourage you to look at the throne 
For you will find that all those things that we place on the throne of our lives, they're like salt gels. And they leave you thirsty. It's only when you and I are totally yielded to the Lordship of Christ that we experience these times of refreshing that Peter's talking about. So we see that our sins are wiped out. We have times of refreshing ahead of us. And we see that Jesus is coming. And for those who repent, they have the hope that Jesus is coming to reign and to judge. That he will come again and make all things right. And you and I can look forward to the final... Two years ago, my wife was walking around on a pair of knees that were just crumbled beyond repair. She could barely walk. She couldn't go upstairs well. In fact, she had to go up like sideways. It was really painful to watch her move. I felt really bad for her. Her knees were just destroyed from wear and tear of this world and from from her experience of life. And so what she did is she got them replaced two years ago. I remember being in the hospital with her when Dr. Burroughs came out, and he said, Bob, those were the two most destroyed knees I've ever seen in my life, especially for someone that young. I was like, wow. And so she got, she got her knees, and she went through the rehab, and you know what? Those knees have made her feel like new. She walks everywhere. She, she can run if she wants but not too much because it's not good for those knees. She's biking all over the place. It's funny, Chuck Amos called me up. He says, Bob, is your your wife biking in my neighborhood? And I said, I don't know, probably. She gets on her bike every day and goes all over creation. She's like a new woman. Why? Why? Because what was broken and destroyed has been made new and that's what jesus will do when he comes he will make all things new he will make all things right but here's the difference between kathy's knees and what jesus is going to do kathy's knees will eventually wear out again and break down that's the problem with this world it always breaks down it always wears out because we live in a sinful, broken world. But when Jesus comes again, he will make all things new. In fact, I am... We have that hope. We can know that our sins are wiped out. The times of refreshing await as our sin is wiped away. And that Jesus is coming and will make all things right. And then there's one final reason to Repent to avoid the wrath of God. For in this passage it says, for those who do not listen or repent, they will be cut off. Peter isn't mincing any words here. Instead of being forgiven of their sin, they will be judged and experience the full wrath of God. For believers who who allow sin to reign in their lives and don't don't repent. There's a broken relationship and there's a consequence of sin and there's a distance in that relationship. See, you and I have the opportunity to repent and return to a Savior who loves us and pursues us. (sighs) Or we can reject Him and be cut off and bear the burden of our sin on our own. So one of the questions I have for us today is what will you do with Jesus? Knowing who he is, knowing what he's done, knowing who you are, will you repent? Will you repent so that your sins are wiped out, so that times of refreshings will come, so that you can anticipate with joy the coming of the Savior and so that you might avoid the wrath of God. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
What an incredible hope. What an incredible reality. You see, in Acts chapter 3, Peter gives us a sermon that tells us who Jesus is. That Jesus is God, the righteous and holy one, our Savior. He tells us what Jesus has done. That he lived, that he died, that he rose, condemned to death and judgment. And so he encourages us to respond. To respond in repentance. Turning around and repenting of our sin. And we should do that. Because when we do, our sins are removed. We experience blessing, hope, and we don't have to fear condemnation because Christ has redeemed and rescued us. May you respond to the gospel, to the good news. May you repent and know that your sin is gone, that God desires to bless your life and give you hope for tomorrow and a life free from condemnation. God is calling us. For some people, he's calling us for the first time. Or maybe he's called us in the the past, but we've allowed sin to reign. He's calling you home. He's calling you back so that you may have those sins wiped out and you may again enjoy those times of refreshing that you may be free from the burden of sin. May you seek his face. I will ask you the same thing that Peter asked his audience in Acts chapter 3. How will you respond to the risen Savior? May you respond in repentance and experience the new life you can have in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for giving us hope and life and joy and peace through Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would just watch over us now, that you would encourage us as we worship in song, as we close out our service, Lord. Help us to, um, help us to, uh, to really consider the areas in our lives that need to be handed over to you. Help us to consider how we are to uh, truly Repent. I don't think we repent very often. I don't. I think that I say that for myself and I say that for, for, for this body. Lord, help us to be people who repent. Help us to see the sin in our lives and to respond to you in repentance. May our minds, may our hearts, may our will and may our soul be impacted and changed. May we run after you. May we seek your face. And may we find hope, life, and joy through your Savior, through the Savior, Jesus. We ask all this in his name. Amen.